Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMY ZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks, his website, rickackerman.com. He's speaking to us from South Florida. Are you? <laughs> I am indeed. We, uh, we, we've had much better weather here. Cooling today, though, where I think it may have gone down into the 50s overnight. And uh, I haven't checked the weather, but maybe that corresponds to some cold wave they're having in the north, uh, north of me. Rick, uh, also a uh, chill uh, sent over the banking sector with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in New York. The small to moderate banks asked for fewer regulations. They got it. And is this the result? Um, yeah, I guess you could say that. You know, uh, David Stockman pointed out the irony of the fact that none other than Barney Frank sits on the board of Signature. And uh, he's Mr. Dodd Frank uh, personified, and I guess when they put him on the board, it was with the drum roll about how they were getting a genius with decades of experience in whatever Barney Frank had experience in. But it certainly wasn't banking, or not in some way that would have saved Signature. So it's sort of funny that Signature has gone down with uh, uh, under the nose of of their board member Barney Frank. So uh, and and. It won't be the last of it, really. You know, when you when you look at how this this uh, weekend very quiet bailout occurred, it was effectively nine trillion dollars in guarantees of money that's obviously not there. Nobody has that money, but of course, when the government steps in and says, "Hey, everything's cool," uh, everybody kind of believes that, uh, except me and perhaps my subscribers. Well, as we know, money really isn't printed anymore. They just uh punch a couple of uh, letters and numbers on a keyboard, and there you go. Here's your uh, million-dollar mortgage. Well, that they actually saved the key punch operator some mm -hmm. work in this instance because they didn't print anything. They just yeah. stepped up and said, hey, look, hey, we're good for it, you know. It's okay. So so it didn't involve any printing. It's, it's almost easier uh, to, to manufacture that $9 trillion guarantee than it is to take Apple and, and and sell it to exhaustion overnight so they can short squeeze it during the day. Uh, I've uh, written about that recently because when you get a, you know, a three, four or five point gap in Apple on, on the opening, you're effectively putting as much as 50 to $100 billion into the economy. That's what happens when you take a two and a half trillion dollar company and you you run it up three or four points on effectively zero volume. That's what a gap is. There's no no stock trading in that gap, and yet the stock is appreciating in value. And, of course, uh, with, with respect to the wealth effect, that money is instantly spendable. Are we going to see more uh, small and medium-sized banks fail? And, and are the big banks in the U.S. still in danger? Everything's in danger. The whole cockamamie banking system is just, uh, you know, if anybody took a close look, um, they're, they're in way over their heads. And I mean way over, way over where, where they were thought to be over their heads with the so-called uh, loans to the, you know, the SNL crisis that got, uh, that got punched up because of uh, loans to uh, third world countries and, and every, everybody else. Uh, we thought those were big numbers then, but they were less than they were less than a, a trillion dollars, much less. And um, so, yeah, I think uh, you, we don't want to look too closely at the banking system. 
What are the collapses due to the move by governments towards digital currency? Well, you know, there's all sorts of wishful conspiracy thinking there, you know, that, well, they, with a capital T, are going to use some banking crisis to implement a digital money system. And um, that's pretty, that's really stupid thinking, because uh, the crisis itself would create a condition of uh, a lack of confidence in the banking system that would make the implementation of a digital money system impossible. Um, if you try to logically think your way through it, how would, how would that be done? Well, because the, 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 forget about a run on the banks, you know, the first three people who line up at various banks in various cities are going to be they're going to find out that the branches only have maybe twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on hand. So we're not going to have a run on cash. And uh, so the banks would close for, let's say, two, three, four days, whatever, however long it takes to to implement the the digital system. And it would have to take the form of zeros being added to your bank account. And I, and I think initially they, with a capital T, would say. Um, whatever you had in your account, trust us, it's still there. And you got to focus on that trust as part of the, <laughs> that, that sentence, you know, uh, nobody will trust anybody at that point. And, um, and even though the government will have told you that that money is still there, and if they wanted to hyperinflate, they could, if, if things got really bad and, and, and it looked like uh, there was a, a, a collapse, even, you know, like a second stage collapse, then they might say, hey, we've just added a zero to your bank account. And uh, at that point, we get on a hyperinflationary track, which, as I've said over many, many years, I don't think I don't think it could possibly happen. Um, I, I won't say it's impossible, but I would say there's only a one percent possibility that all the debts that we piled up will somehow be discharged in a hyperinflation, uh, leaving all the creditors out to sea, you know, they'll, they'll be the big losers. I don't think so. Um, so, so anyway, about this digital money system, we already have a digital money system. It's called credit cards. You know, nobody uses cash for big transactions. It's just groceries. So, uh, so we are, the digital money system is just fine. And, and it's, doing a much better job than, than Bitcoin or any of the cryptos ever did, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's obvious that nobody uses cryptos to buy stuff. They just use it um, to speculate. And it, it, it recalls the joke about uh, the punchline of which is, oh, those aren't, those aren't eating sardines. Those are trading sardines. So that's what Bitcoin is. It's, uh, it's a lot of trading sardines. And... Um, and uh, I, I don't say that Bitcoin is without value, but I think three or four bucks w would do it, not $70,000. And I, I give it three or four dollars worth of valuation simply because the, the blockchain idea is pretty good. It's a, it's a very useful way to record transactions in a more or less secure way. Um, so it does have value for transactions, which, as I just mentioned, it's, it's never used for transactions. But just to give Bitcoin some hypothetical value, I'd set it at around three or four bucks rather than a current, uh, where are we trading today, 24,883 as I speak. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I'm not uh, gung-ho on, on uh, uh, <laughs> well, you don't actually bury your Bitcoin in the backyard like you do with gold. But uh, you, you have it sold it away somewhere. Now, countries like Canada and the UK years ago sold off all their gold at bargain basement prices. Does the U.S. have any gold to back up its currency, or is Fort Knox just uh, an empty structure with a lot of guns around it? Well, that's that's a, a fun story, really. I don't know. I mean, who knows what what the actual gold holdings of the U.S. are, and. And it's not as though merely holding them predisposes them toward having honest money if we emerge from some crisis. You know, it's uh, the, the last thing, the, the most deflationary thing you could have is money tied to gold, honest money. And you can imagine how sales of 
things like crude oil would drop, uh, people, if we had to pay for them in gold, you know, we talk about it. It's convenient to pay for them in dollars because dollars have been infinitely available. And, uh, you know, the, the oil producers sort of get, get into the game, into the charade. They just raise prices. That's all to, to at least partly offset the inflation of, uh, of, a, of a financialized world. So, um, so uh, uh, the, the com- there are countries, though, that hold gold um, in, in the way that uh, a lot of, uh, of <laughs> a lot of my subscribers do, you know, just for that rainy day. They don't have a, uh, a, this greedy idea that they're going to make their fortune in gold, but it's, uh, it's just a, a good thing to keep around because it's very likely to hold its purchasing power relative to any other asset you can name. Um, so, so countries like, uh, like China, for one, has encouraged its citizens to buy and hold gold. And I think there's a sufficient reverence for gold I- among the Chinese that, uh, the government doesn't have to have an official policy or, or a, um, you know, a, a huge inventory of Fort, of Fort Knox of its own. It doesn't need it as long as its people are saving at least some of their money in gold. And, uh, Russia, I think, probably has uh, let's more explicitly geopolitical designs in whatever gold it holds. But uh, but uh, to speak of Russia to to uh, personify it, it, it's it's no fool as far as gold and and its perception of the Western money system is uh, somewhat compromised. I think uh, the attitude. With the Canadian government as well, Canada, the country itself has gold deposits, so we'll just go out and mine some if we need it. Well, <laughs> Canada, for all the foolishness of your uh, uh, of its leaders, um, it does possess the resources that gold would command in, in some sort of crisis, and uh, no one should think that if they've got uh, a, a safe deposit box filled with Krugerrands that those Krugerrands are necessarily going to buy a whole lot. In, you know, uh, I always tell my subscribers that uh, if they if they really, their hearts are set on keeping gold until it hits 50000 they better find themselves one dumb farmer to buy something, uh, to buy farmland, which, of course, uh, produces things that people can eat. But the, uh, the gold itself... Uh, you, you can't eat it, and there may come a day, <laughs> I hope it never comes, but there may, may come a day when the bread truck arrives, the, the government's bread truck, and you need to pay, uh, or you offer a Krugeran in exchange for a loaf of bread, and, and the guy says, well, I can't eat that Krugeran, it'll be two Krugerans for the loaf today. So, um, so uh, anyway, uh, gold uh, is lacking the, the fungibility of some of the things. No, I I won't, no, I won't put it in terms of fungibility because there'll always be someone willing to exchange good things for gold. But in the case of Canada, you've got all the natural resources to, uh, to stay alive. Of course, we have a government that refuses to use them. (laughs) Yeah, but, but it's, it's nice to have, I mean, you guys are, you guys are pretty self-sufficient when you measure China's, uh, Canada's uh, resources, its agricultural productivity and energy resources, mineral resources, against your relatively sparse population. Uh, you've got plenty to go around. That's true. Canada's got five big cities, six. <laughs> That's it. That's right. And lots of room in between them. We'll have more uh, with Rick Ackerman right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, what do you think is going to happen with oil, which has dropped dramatically? Yeah, I don't follow the story, the story because I can never really understand why crude does what it does. Um, but I can certainly chart it. And uh, yesterday's low 
could have been an, uh, an important low. It did connect up with the, the target I had for a bearish pattern. Um, but th- there's a problem, really, with crude coming down the way it has. You might think, well, it's going to show up as lower prices at the gas pump, and isn't that great for everybody? Um, and it will lower production costs for, for all uh, industry manufacturing that is uh, energy uh, intensive. But uh, that's that's sort of a long way off. It's uh, the question is, can you wait? And the financial uh, problems that uh, attend collapse in oil prices are much more significant than the somewhere down the road benefits of lower energy prices. Uh, mainly because uh, when we came out of the uh, housing collapse of 2007 and 8, uh, the smart guys looked around and thought, well, what the hell can we hack up, hock up to our eyeballs to get rich again? Uh, without doing any work, just shuffling a lot of paper. And the obvious answer was the energy patch. So, so a lot of the collateral that went into the, the, the inflation that we've experienced in assets, uh, since recovering from the 2007 8 co- collapse, uh, uh, has come from, uh, 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 energy, uh, loans against energy productivity. So, uh, so the world sort of needs higher energy prices, uh, higher oil prices, let's say, in natural gas, um, yeah. than it does lower prices at the pump. And uh, so, so the whole shaky financial edifice, and I'm talking about a good piece of the two-plus quadrillion-dollar derivatives market, uh, is not benefiting from uh, this uh, very steep downtrend in crude. And if it keeps going, you're going to be reading about it as a uh, reading about what a problem it is in the same way I'm describing to you now. It's one of the problems with crude. Governments have stopped subsidizing the search for oil and new oil rigs, and oil companies don't want to spend their own money. And they've realized, like they did last year, the less we produce, the more money we make. Well, it would be great if that's all we were doing. We were stopping the, the subsidies of oil, but but you, the the Interior Secretary uh, is uh, st- so zealously carrying out Biden's policy of let's do away with all the energy productivity now, and we'll, we'll somehow we'll, we'll we'll produce alternatives later on. So it's not a question of just the subsidies or not being made any longer the exploration is being actively thwarted discouraged uh whatever well yes uh, th- now people want to transit or transition i guess into electric vehicles alternative energy but there doesn't seem to be any bridging strategy to help that out and the government's only strategy here in canada is to add more carbon taxes at the gasoline pump Right, and and we all know that every penny of those taxes is being spent on a brighter future. You know, it wouldn't be misdirected, redirected into other areas such as, well, in the U.S. even, you'd think they'd be paying Social Security checks or something like that. Mm. So I think that's probably, well... Uh, uh, the main objection to energy taxes, we, we can all we, we all have to doubt that they're being uh, productively deployed. The government uh, doesn't deploy any any tax money in an efficient, effective, uh, productive, growth oriented way. I think uh, in Norway, they put uh, their oil royalties into their pension plan. And so people there actually have per person millions of dollars at least uh, years ago it was a million a person and it's probably more than that now because they know oil is going to run out at some point well they should ask the uh, the native americans in alaska how's that working for you you know um it's nice that uh, we've got this this hypothetical figure of everybody's divvying up the uh, the energy resources of norway and and i don't doubt that uh, that norway's used it, the proceeds from uh, from uh, sale the sale of crude oil uh, in a way that has that will benefit them over the long run. I, I give them a benefit of the doubt for having more foresight and integrity than than their counterparts in the U.S. 
Wow. Um, I just went to uh, Norwegian Oil Fund, and they have a tracker here showing you how much it's growing in value by every second. Uh, boy, I don't know what kroner are worth, but they've got a lot of them in there. So well, you know, with oils, uh, with the fall of crude from, you know, $80 down to 60, recent 66 that number, that uh, number that the Norwegians check before they even had their coffee in the morning, has probably come down a little bit. Well, fourteen billion something. And 14, the, uh, did, 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 I'm sorry, did you say zillion? Uh, fourteen billion. Oh, okay, okay. And, zillion, and there's what three to five more. million. I'm, I'm not sure of the exact population of Norway, but I'd say three to five million, about the same as the population of British Columbia. Well, well, some someone's got to go over there and sell them some term insurance or something. With all that money, they they should be uh, sitting ducks for the the sales force of the world. Uh, let's see. Well, five point four five million persons. Oh, I wasn't far off. So, uh, Rick, what's going to go on with real estate in this kind of uh, atmosphere? Are mortgages guaranteed? If the bank goes under, do you lose your house? I, I don't know how that works. I'm glad you asked. Uh, the, the good news in a real crisis is that we're not going to lose our homes because the, uh, the lenders who technically own those homes, uh, they're, they're not going to want to put everyone, and I mean everyone, out on the streets. So we'll keep our houses, but uh, we're having a silent crash right now in real estate. Uh, this is something we talked about six months ago, but but the uh, <clears throat> the dynamic has it's, it's probably it's intensified somewhat. Uh, you have a situation really where there are X number of baby boomers who would love to downsize, <clears throat> and they're sitting in homes that are overvalued by who knows eighty uh, percent relative to. <clears throat> it's hard to say w- what those homes would be worth if we didn't have uh, you know three percent mortgages for all those years. So. Um, so they'd love to get rid of them, but there are no buyers, and certainly not, no buyers with mortgages up at 7%. And, um, you know, the, um, so, so the homeowners are just sort of sitting tight and thinking, well, I don't have to sell this place. I can just keep living in it. So what will happen eventually is that uh, the, the, the bids will fall away. There will be no bids. And there won't be any qualified buyers either. So the homes are all going to revert to the children. They're going to be passed down in, uh, from the baby boomers, boomers estate to their children and grandchildren who won't be able to pay the taxes on them, which will destroy the, the local tax base of all, all the cities in America. You know, they're collecting taxes on homes in some boondock subdivision that you can't find a, a, a state that's boondocky enough that it doesn't have uh, a whole bunch of six hundred thousand dollar homes so when those homes seek out their proper value maybe a hundred grand uh the the tax revenues that uh, come to the local jurisdictions are going to are going to vanish so that's a big problem down the road but more immediately we have the problem of uh, the big guys getting into spec house home rentals in, in a big way. And um, uh, they are, I think, more than 10% of the market right now. More than 10% of our homes are owned by speculators trying to rent them. All right. Now, for, for starters, if you're renting out a home, the question is to whom? Well, to someone who can't afford a home to buy a home. So, so all these rentals are being done to ostensibly uh, less than uh, stellar credit risks. But if you take, let's take a specific place. Let's go to Las Vegas. All right. Now, um, Zillow owns, I think it's four thousand homes in in Las Vegas, and uh, of those four thousand, about four hundred are vacant. And you can imagine that the, the ten percent is certainly enough uh, uh, enough vacancies to throw off their entire model um, to to make what look like a profitable idea going in unprofitable. And they the, the real problem is that they can't they can't lower the rents uh, to fill those vacant homes because if they do it will deep 
it will uh, push the value of all 4,000 homes that they own downward. It'll put pressure on them because if the, you know, if you're calculating the value of a home based on what it could produce in rental income, um, the, if, if rentals are, are, are soft, then the prices are going to come down. So, and once that happens, it's very hard to lift them up again. Uh, because you need another crazy boom to do that. I think we've run out of crazy booms. All right. So, so instead of um, instead of uh, lowering the rent uh, for their four thousand homes, they're offering incentives for people to come in. You know, you rent now, and we'll give you the first two months free. So that's sort of masking the weakness in in the housing market there and masking. Uh, what would otherwise be the beginning of a collapse in real estate places in Las Vegas. And I, I don't mean to imply that this, this is ju- it's just Las Vegas. This is all over the country where these same deals play out. All right. It also doesn't help that the homes were acquired at the, at the top of the market. And not only that, but in order to whip them into shape quickly to rent them out, uh, the, the spec buyers, Zillow and, and BlackRock and all those, um, they paid top dollar. Um, so why did they do that? Well, their, their, their bean counters said, look, um, you know, who cares what we pay for these homes or what we pay to pay to fix them up. Just look at this on a 10 year accrual. Everything looks great 10 years out. So that's what they're stuck with now. Their, their, their numbers are not panning out. And of course it's the same way that, you know, an 8% of uh, factoring 8% growth, for all the uh, investments, uh, the pension fund investments, it's the same fallacy, really. They're, they're taking a straight line extrapolation, saying things are great now and they'll never be less than great. But uh, it's telling you something when the, the assumptions of the actuaries that, uh, <clears throat> that essentially gin up numbers for the pension funds are, are, not, are, are probably higher than what, what uh, Warren Buffett has said. Uh, taken out of the markets in the last 10 years. So, um, so that's the problem in real estate. Do uh, all these people in the stock markets, financial scene pay t- way too much attention to the federal reserve? Well, it's all they care about. It's not too much attention. It's the only thing they pay attention to. And, and we've reached a point really where all news Unless it's really a, a bombshell, like uh, like uh, what's his face Powell's last announcement about no, not only are we not pivoting, but we're going to kind of accelerate the t- the uh, the tightening. All right, so that did catch the market by surprise, but virtually any other news is is used to to, to jack stocks. Um, you know, we, we saw it today. Uh, I think the uh, unemployment is is uh, unemployment claims were down or something like that. And whatever way the market zigs or zags in the first few seconds, it doesn't matter. You'll see that virtually every news, it just the mere element of surprise in it or what little surprise there is, is exploited as a short squeeze opportunity. So, so everything we read about connected to the economy, it, it has no significance other than what all the idiots out there think it will mean to the Fed. You know, uh, well, payroll is, is uh, jobs are down, unemployment claims are up, down, whatever. Uh, the first instinct is, well, what? How will the Fed interpret this? And whatever the answer is, I just mentioned it, the the surprise of it um, is used to to ambush shorts you don't you don't ambush longs uh you can have what's called a long squeeze but it's not something we've seen in 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 a long 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 very long time but the short squeeze is uh it's the easiest um goosing it's the easiest way to jack the markets to manipulate them uh meaning it'll always be higher and uh as if the initial faint is lower you gotta buy it because just you know there's a mission out there to keep the stock market, to keep stock prices up. Uh, some analysts have suggested uh, the market's had a, a great climb, but if there's a further decline, it's going to be the the anti-slope. Uh, I, I don't know the exact term for it, but if it, it climbed 40%, it's going to drop 40%. We wish. 
you know, uh, the, to think that it's just going to return to some some semblance of normal in terms of earnings multiples or whatever, that's wishful thinking. You know, you're always going to you're going to overshoot to the extreme. Uh, we're not coming back to to the mean mean average line. Uh, we're going to overshoot uh, what might be seen now, imagined as the lower threshold of rationality. So, so don't. Uh, I wouldn't put too much hope in a, a mere forty percent correction uh, of perceived excesses to the upside of forty percent. Rick, anything else we should be keeping a close eye on right now? <laughs> I'd say avert avert your eyes from newspapers, from headlines, and all that. But uh, um, I, I don't know. It's uh, this um, the business with the banks. What, what's What's more unsettling than the fact that uh, the third, the second and third largest bank failures in U.S. history both went down over the same weekend? Well, more unsettling than that is what is passing for a a, a remedy. You know, the, uh, the 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 blather that went out to calm the herd is so lacking in substance and and uh persuasiveness uh, you gotta you gotta you gotta be crazy to think that we've seen the worst of it rick thank you so much for chatting with us oh always a pleasure jim i don't mean to darken your day maybe we could talk about uh, a sunnier topic next time but uh anyway thanks for inviting me on my guest has been Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks. His website, rickackerman.com. If you have any questions for Rick or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.